Glam's Castle. Of all the hauntings in Scotland, none has gained such widespread notoriety as the hauntings of Glam's Castle, the seat of the Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn in Forfarshire. Part of the castle, that part which is the more frequently haunted, is of ancient though uncertain date, and if there is any truth in the tradition that Duncan was murdered there by Macbeth, must, at any rate, have been in existence at the commencement of the 11th century. Of course, extra buildings have from time to time been added and renovations made, but the original structure remains pretty nearly the same as it has always been, and is included in a square tower that occupies a central position and commands a complete view of the entire castle. Within this tower, the walls of which are 15 feet thick, there is a room hidden in some unsuspected quarter that contains a secret, the keynote to at least one of the hauntings, which is known only to the Earl, his heir, on the attainment of his 21st birthday and the factor of the estate. In all probability, the mystery attached to this room would challenge but little attention were it not for the fact that unearthly noises, which at the time were supposed to proceed from this chamber, have been heard by various visitors sleeping in the square tower. The following experience is said to have happened to a lady named Bond. I append it more or less in her words. It is a good many years since I stayed at Glam's. I was, in fact, but little more than a child, and had only just gone through my first season in town. But though young, I was neither nervous nor imaginative. I was inclined to be in what was termed stolid, that is to say, extremely matter-of-fact and practical. Indeed, when my friends exclaimed, You don't mean to say you're going to stay at Glam's? Don't you know it's haunted? I burst out laughing. Haunted, I said. How ridiculous. There are no such things as ghosts. One might as well believe in fairies. Of course, I did not go to Glam's alone. My mother and sister were with me, but whereas they slept in the more modern part of the castle, I was, at my own request, apportioned a room in the square tower. I cannot say that my choice had anything to do with the secret chamber. That, and the alleged mystery, had been dinned into my ears so often that I had grown thoroughly sick of the whole thing. No, I wanted to sleep in the square tower for quite different reason. A reason of my own. I kept an aviary. The tower was old, and I naturally hoped the walls would be covered with ivy, teeming with bird's nests, some of which I might be able to reach, and, I am ashamed to say, plunder, from my window. Alas for my expectations, although the square tower was so ancient in some places it was actually crumbling away. Not the sign of a leaf, not the vestige of a bird's nest could I see anywhere. The walls were abominably brutally bare. However, it was not long before my disappointment gave way to delight. For the air that blew in through my open window was so sweet, so richly scented with heather and honeysuckle, and the view of the broad, sweeping, thickly wooded grounds so indescribably charming, that despite in my inartistic and unpoetical nature, I was entranced, entranced as I had never been before and never have been since. Ghosts, I said to myself. Ghosts, how absurd, how preposterously absurd. Such an adorable spot as this can only harbour sunshine and flowers. I will remember too, for as I have already said, I was not poetical. How much I enjoyed my first dinner at Glam's. The long journey in keen mountain air had made me hungry, and I thought I had never tasted such delicious food, such ideal salmon from the Esk, and such heavenly fruit. But I must tell you that, although I ate heartily, as a healthy girl should, by the time I went to bed I had thoroughly digested my meal and was, in fact, quite ready to partake of a few oatmeal biscuits I had found in my dressing case, and remembered having bought at Perth. It was about eleven o'clock when my maid left me, and I sat for some minutes wrapped in my dressing gown before the open window. The night was very still, 
and save for the occasional rustle of the wind in the distant treetops, and the hooting of an owl, the melancholy cry of a peewit, and a hoarse barking of a dog, the silence was undisturbed. The interior of my room was, in nearly every particular, modern. The furniture was not old. There were no grim carvings, no grotesquely fashioned tapestries on the walls, no dark cupboards, no gloomy corners. All was cosy and cheerful, and when I got into bed, no thought of bogle or mystery entered my mind. In a few minutes I was asleep, and for some time there was nothing but a blank, a blank in which all identity was annihilated. Then suddenly I found myself in an oddly shaped room with a lofty ceiling, and a window situated so great a distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within. Feeble gleams of phosphorescent light made their way through the narrow panes, and served to render distinct the more prominent objects around. But my eyes struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the wall, one of which inspired me with terror such as I had never felt before. The walls were covered with heavy draperies that were sufficient in themselves to preclude the possibility of any save the loudest of sounds penetrating without. The furniture, if what such one could call it, puzzled me. It was more fitted for the cell of a prison or a lunatic asylum, or even for a kennel, than for ordinary dwelling room. I could see no chair, only a coarse deal table, a straw mattress, and a kind of trough. An air of irredeemable gloom and horror hung over and pervaded everything. As I stood there, I felt I was waiting for something, something that was concealed in the corner of the room I dreaded. I tried to reason with myself, to assure myself there was nothing there that could hurt me, nothing that could even terrify me, but my efforts were in vain, my fears grew. Had I had some definite knowledge as to the cause of my alarm, I should not have suffered so much, but it was my ignorance of what was there, of what I feared, that made my terror so poignant. Each second saw the agony of my suspense increase. I dared not move. I hardly dared breathe. I dreaded lest the violent pulsation of my heart would attract the attention of the unknown presence and precipitate its coming out. Yet despite the perturbation of my mind, I caught myself analysing my feelings. It was not danger I bored so much as its absolute effect, fright. I shuddered at the bare thought of what the result of the most trivial incident, the creaking of a board, ticking of a beetle, or hooting of an owl might have on the intolerable agitation of my soul. In this unnerved and pitiable condition, I felt the period was bound to come sooner or later when I should have to abandon life and reason in the most desperate of struggles with fear. At length something moved. An icy chill ran through my frame, and the horror of my anticipations immediately reached its culminating point. The presence was about to reveal itself. The gentle rubbing of a soft body on the floor, the crack of a bony joint, breathing, another crack, and then, was it my own excited imagination, or the disturbing influence of the atmosphere, or the uncertain twilight of the chamber that produced before me the stygian darkness of the recess, the vacillating and indistinct outline of something luminous and horrid. I would gladly have risked futurity to have looked elsewhere. I could not. My eyes were fixed. I was compelled to gaze in front of me. Slowly, very slowly, the thing, whatever it was, took shape. Legs, crooked misshapen human legs, a body, tawny and hunched, arms, long and spidery, with crooked knotted fingers, 
a head large and bestial and covered with a tangled mass of grey hair that hung around its protruding forehead and pointed ears and ghastly mockery of curls. A face, and herein was the realisation of all my direst expectations. A face, white and staring, pig-like in formation, malevolent in expression, a hellish combination of all things foul and animal, and yet, withal, not without a touch of pathos. As I stared at it aghast, it reared itself on its haunches after the manner of an ape and leered piteously at me. Then, shuffling forward, it rolled over and lay sprawled with the most appalling screams I have ever heard. The screams of something or of someone for there was in them a certain element of what was human, as well as animal, in the greatest distress. Wondering what it meant, and more than ever terrified, I sat up in bed and listened. Listened whilst the conviction, a result of intuition, suggestion, or what you will, but a conviction all the same, forced me to associate the sounds with the thing in my dream, and I associate them still. It was, I think, in the same year, in the year that the foregoing account was narrated to me, that I heard another story of the hauntings of Glams, a story in connection with a lady whom I will call Miss McGuinney. I append her experience as nearly as possible as she is stated to have told it. I seldom talk about my adventure. Miss McGuinney announced, because so many people ridiculed the superphysical and laugh at the mere mention of ghosts. I own I did my, the same myself till I stayed at Glam's, but a week there quite cured me of scepticism, and I came away a confirmed believer. The incident occurred nearly 20 years ago, shortly after my return from India, where my father was then stationed. It was years since I'd been to Scotland, Indeed, I had only once crossed the border, and that was when I was a babe. Consequently, I was delighted to receive an invitation and spend a few weeks in the land of my birth. I went to Edinburgh first. I was born in Drumshire Gardens, and thence to Glam's. It was late in the autumn. The weather was intensely cold, and I arrived at the castle in a blizzard. Indeed, I do not recollect ever having been out in such frightful storm. It was as much as the horses could do to make headway, and when we reached the castle, we found a crowd of anxious faces eagerly awaiting us in the hall. Chilled! I was chilled to the bone, and I thought I would never thaw. But the huge fires and bright, cosy atmosphere of the rooms, for the interior of Glam's was modernised throughout, soon set me to right, and by tea time, I felt nicely warm and comfortable. My bedroom was in the oldest part of the castle, the square tower, but although I had been warned by some of the guests that it might be haunted, I can assure you that when I went to bed, no subject was farther from my thoughts than the subject of ghosts. I returned to my room about half past eleven. The storm was then at its height, all was babble and confusion. Impenetrable darkness mingled with the wildest roaring and shrieking, and when I peeped through my casement window, I would see nothing. The panes were shrouded in snow, snow which was incessantly dashed against them in cyclonic fury. I fixed the comb in the window frame so as not to be kept awake by the constant jarring, and with caution I looked into the wardrobe and under the bed for burglars. Though heaven knows what I should have done had I found one there, placed the candlestick and matchbox on the table by my bedside, lest the roof or window should be blown in during the night and any other catastrophe happen, and after all these preparations, got into bed. At this period of my life I was a sound sleeper, and being somewhat unusually tired after my journey, I was soon in a dreamless slumber. What awoke me, I cannot say, but I came to myself with a violent start such as might have been occasioned by a loud noise. 
Indeed, that was at first my impression, and I strained my ears to try and ascertain the cause of it. All was, however, silent. The storm had abated, and the castle and grounds were wrapped in an almost preternatural hush. The sky had cleared, and the room was partially illuminated by a broad stream of silvery light that filtered softly in through the white and tightly drawn blinds. A feeling that there was something unnatural in the air, that the stillness was but the prelude to some strange and startling event, gradually came over me. I strove to reason with myself, to argue that the feeling was wholly due to the novelty of my surroundings, but my efforts were fruitless, and soon there stole upon me a sensation to which I have hitherto been an utter stranger. I became afraid. An irrepressible tremor pervaded my frame, my teeth chattered, my blood froze. Obeying an impulse, an impulse I could not resist, I lifted myself up from the pillows and peering fearfully into the shadowy glow that lay directly in front of me, listened. Why I listened I do not know, saving that an instinctive spirit prompted me. At first I could hear nothing, and then from a direction I could not define there came a noise, low, distinct, uninterpretive. It was repeated in rapid succession and speedily construed itself into the sound of mailed footsteps racing up the long flight of stairs at the end of the corridor leading to my room. Dreading to think what it might be, I seized with a wild sentiment of self-preservation. I made frantic endeavours to get out of bed and barricade my door. My limbs, however, refused to move. I was paralysed. Nearer and nearer drew the sounds, and I could at length distinguish with a clearness that petrified my very soul. The banging and clanging of sword scabbards, and the panting and gasping of men, sore pressed in a wild and desperate race. And then the meaning of it all came to me with hideous abruptness. It was a case of pursuing and pursued. The race was for life. Outside my door the fugitive halted, and from the noise he made in trying to draw his breath I knew he was dead beat. His antagonist, however, gave him but scant time for recovery. Bounding at him with prodigious leaps, he struck him a blow that sent him reeling with such tremendous force against the door, and the panels, although composed of the stoutest oak, quivered and strained like flimsy matchboard. The blow was repeated. The cry that rose in the victim's throat was converted into an abortive, gurgling groan, and I heard the ponderous battle axe carve its way through helmet, bone and brain. A moment later the sound of slithering armour and the corpse sliding sideways toppled to the ground with a sonorous clang. A silence, too awful for words, now ensued. Having finished his hideous handiwork, the murderer was quietly deliberating what to do next, whilst my dread of attracting his attention was so great that I scarcely dare breathe. This intolerable state of things had already lasted for what seemed to me a lifetime, when glancing involuntarily at the floor I saw a stream of dark-looking fluid lazily lapping its way to me from the direction of the door. Another moment and it would reach my shoes. In my dismay, I shrieked aloud. There was a sudden stir without, a significant clatter of steel, and the next moment, despite the fact that it was locked, the door slowly opened. The limits of my endurance had now happily been reached. The overtaxed valves of my heart could stand no more. I fainted. On my awakening to consciousness it was morning and the welcome sun rays revealed no evidences of the distressing drama. I own I had a hard tussle before I could make up my mind to spend another night in the room, and my feelings as I shut the door on my retreating maid and prepared to get into bed were not the most enviable. But nothing happened, nor did I again experience anything of the sort till the evening before I left. I had lain down all the afternoon, I was tired from a long morning's tramp on the moors, a thing I dearly love, 
And I was thinking about the time to get up when a dark shadow suddenly fell across my face. I looked up hastily and there, standing by my bedside and bending over me, was a gigantic figure in bright armour. Its visor was up and what I saw within the cask had stamped forever on my memory. It was the face of the dead, the long since dead, with the expression, hellish expression, of the living. As I gazed helplessly at it, it bent lower. I threw up my hands to ward it off. There was a loud rap at the door. As my maid softly entered to tell me tea was ready, it vanished. <laughs>